that set me free. When I get to heaven, if you're looking for me, you'll look for Jesus, because that's where I'll be. Amen. I love my dad and I love my mom, but I want to tell you, I'll be looking for Jesus. <laughs> I want to share some time with that man and thank him for all he's done for me. Because Amen. I could never, uh, that song that Randy just sang, I just can't imagine a man leaving heaven and coming to earth dying on Calvary. Uh, because of that, you can lock me up, open my eyes out, take away my food. You can kill this old body, but I'll still go free. Bind my hands, bind my feet. Uh, but because of Jesus, I'll still be free. And I praise God for that. That's just a beautiful, beautiful word of sin. If you will, open your Bibles to uh, 1 John chapter uh, we're going to start uh, with verse uh, 3 this morning. Uh, John County uh, hits home. Uh, I do want to make it uh, clear this morning, if there's anybody that believes uh, in security of the believer, I believe that. Um, but I believe that it has been uh, somewhat today may be abused uh, because I think today that uh, so many times we think we can have a uh, repeat after me a few words, hand me a card to remember the date that I did that and uh, continue to live the life that I lived before and I'm okay and we get secured with that and that has nothing to do with the security that the Bible teaches. And John is going to get into that this morning. Uh, and I think sometimes we leave that off. We just say, well, they backslid or they did this or they did that. Or, uh, and I'm not one to be the judge as to who stands where. Uh, but I do know that if you go to Matthew chapter 7 and read the words of Jesus, Jesus said there's going to be many that are going to go, go down the broad way. And he said there's going to be few that's going to go in the narrow. Now that come out of the mouth of Jesus. That didn't come out of the mouth of Gary Burton. And he also said that there's going to be many that's going to say, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out devils in your name? And he's going to say, depart from you, me, I never knew you. And that means that they never had a personal relationship with him. I think there's a lot of people today that says that they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that no more knows Jesus Christ. Uh, and I mean, the world shows that today. Uh, we cannot be a Christian nation and be making the decisions that we're making today. Uh, and you look around and statistics says that it's in the mid uh, to upper 70s that are Christians in the world today. That cannot be true uh, in making the decisions that we're making in the world today. John is going to hit that and hit it hard today. And I just want you to listen to what John has to say after he had walked with Jesus, been with Jesus, saw Jesus with his own eyes, heard Jesus with his own ears, uh, what John has to say. And I'm only going to read verse 3. I'm going to try to get through verse 11. I'm not sure that we'll get that far uh, because there are just some uh, very strong statements that we need to really listen to what John has to say. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. If you can comfortably stand, if not, feel free to remain seated. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. He said, now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Take a moment, ask the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart for his word. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, we come, Father, asking for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. 
upon a body of clay, upon this mind, upon these lips, upon this tongue, that would speak nothing but what you would have me to say from the throne of grace this morning. We know, Father, that our security comes only through you. We know that our grace to live a Christian life comes only through you. And we know, Father, that we cannot live a perfect life. But, Father, I go back to what Dr. Mitchell said many years ago, and I know that he's there worshiping you now. You've already called him in to eternity through death. But God, a child of God that has a knowing, personal relationship with you, when they sin, it hurts them. It grieves the Holy Spirit that you placed inside them. They don't just continue to live the life of sin and not be grieved because of their relationship with you. And I pray, Father, that you take your word today and that you allow your word to penetrate our hearts and our minds. And God, that you use your word, send it forth to accomplish your divine will. And God, for someone here today that does not know you in a personal relationship, would you draw them and let them see the love that you had sending your son to the cross of Calvary to pay for the price of their sins and would you draw them to a personal relationship with you today in this service. There's someone that has left their first love. Would you, Holy Spirit, convict them and draw them back to their first love through confessing their sins to you. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray. really <clears throat> contemplated on not preaching this sermon this morning because I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I feel like this is a sermon that needs to be preached when there's 80 or 90 or 150 people here that needs to hear uh, this sermon. Uh, because verse 3 is such a strong, strong statement from the Word of God that God Told John, and again, we need to emphasize, as I do so many times, that this is not John just sitting down and saying, I think I'm going to write something in the Word of God, and this is what he decides to write. But this is what John writes because God told John to write this. This is God sent through John. John took a quill. John took a scroll, and God said to John, write this down. Now look at what he said. Now by this, let's stop right there. He's about to tell us something. By this, we know that we know him. Now he put a comma right there. By this, this is a statement this is something, this is a criteria, that this is a measuring bar that you can always pull out and you can determine in your walk, you can look at it and see if you know that you know God. You can know that you know and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what God has said for John to write. By this, we know that we know him. And what did he say? I think we have got it so messed up in the world today. I remember, and we want to go back, and people don't want to talk about, well, I'm living in adultery or I'm, I, I never go to church. I never pick up my Bible. I never read my Bible. I never do any of the things that the Bible teaches me, but I'm a Christian. 
I do, I, I, I know that I got saved when I was six years old or when I was 12 years old. And I remember when I walked down that aisle and I remember who the preacher was and I remember this. Do you see any of that in that verse there? Do you see any of that that said that's what we need to know so that we know that we know him? There's none of that in there. And we're going to get deeper into that as to how that we know that we know that we're a child of God. But John starts out with the word here that he says, by this we know that we know him. He says, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What does keep mean? Does it mean that I read them every day or what does it mean? It means, that word keep means to guard his commandments. I treasure his commandments. I not only read his commandments, I not only go to church to hear a message and say, boy, that was a good sermon, and I leave it there, but I take that word of God and I let it penetrate my mind and I let it change my behavior. That's keeping God's commandments. It's something that changes our everyday walk of life, and we're going to find that as we go on through this scripture. But I want you to notice how emphatic he was by this. Now, by this, we know that we know him. He uses that word know twice. We know that we know him if, conditional, if we keep his commandments. Now, let's look at verse 4. Because John just gets in your face with this. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is what? He's a liar. Now, boy, none of us want to be called a liar. None of us want to be called a liar and say, you're a liar. But God is saying through John's writings, if you're walking around and you're living out of the commandments of God, and you're saying, I'm a child of God, he says, if you say, I know him, and you do not keep his commandments, the Bible says you're a liar and the truth is not in you. <laughs> See, that's what is deceiving in the world today. Is people today are walking around saying, I'm a Christian and living outside what everything that God teaches in the world today. But yet we want to hold the flag up and say, I'm a Christian. And they want the preacher when the times come for a funeral to say, that man went to heaven. And there's nobody, nobody that I know of that has went to hell in the last several years at a funeral. I mean, nobody that I have talked to has said, if I die, I'm going to hell. Everybody's going to heaven. But how many people do you see are following God's commandments? And see, it's not for me to judge. But I think when you get to heaven, and I, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to go around and look and say, well, I, I told Joe so-and-so said he was going to be here, but he's not here. I don't think that's going to be going on. I think there's going to be a worship service for Jesus going on. Amen. But I think there's going to be a lot of people that's walking around down here that's saying, hey, I'm on my way to heaven that's going to burn in hell for eternity. Because they never knew that they knew that they knew Jesus because they never had a personal relationship with him because they went up, signed a little card, shook a preacher's hand, said a few words that he said, and so repeated them after him and never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because they never followed his commandments. They never had a commitment to him. They never followed what he said. They never had any direction to be a life, a character after the life of Jesus Christ. That was the furthest thing from their mind and they lived their life here on the face of this earth and then when they stood before him, not Gary Burton, not the church at Copper Spring, not the Southern Baptist Convention, but a man named Jesus Christ stood before him and said, I don't know who you are. Depart from me. Oh, Lord. That's going to be a solemn cry that there'll be no reversal for. I can't imagine what that's going to be. 
You know, they sing that old, uh, Randy was talking about the old Southern Gospel song. I think it's Miss Donna Pennington that sings it with the praise team sometimes. Please search the book again. I think there's going to be some people falling on their knees and say, could you just please search the book again? No, there's not going to be no search in the book again. When he says, depart from me, I don't know who you are. I don't have you recorded in this book. You're not under the blood of Jesus Christ. You never had a personal relationship with me. Yes, you may have went and shook a preacher's hand. You may have been baptized. You may have put your name on a church roll somewhere, but you were never, ever born again. You didn't follow the commandments of God. Why did you not follow the commandments of God? Because you had no resource inside you to be able to enable you to follow the commandments of God. I can't live a Christian life. Sammy Duncan can't live a Christian life. Keith can't live a Christian life. Barney can't live a Christian life. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit that comes to live inside of us when we are born again. That's the only way that we can live a Christian life. Amen. That's the only way that we can follow those commandments. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And when we say that we know him and do not keep his commandments, the word of God said we're a liar and the truth is not in him. Let's look at verse 5. But whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Does that mean that we're perfect? No, what he's saying is whoever keeps his word, whoever starts reading his word, growing in his word, being taught by his word, being in the sermon and listening to the sermon, being taught in the word of God, in your daily devotion, what he means is you're maturing. The word perfect a lot of times in the New Testament, most of the time, is not talking about perfect without any fault that's totally blameless. It's talking about maturing. And it takes, I think sometimes we think that we just should be able to develop and and be a, 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 an apple overnight. We don't need any blossoms. We don't need any blooms. We don't need anything. We should just be a full-grown apple with seeds in it and ready to eat overnight. It don't happen that way. We have to grow. We have to mature. We have to read the Bible. And that's what he said. Who keeps the word of God? Truly the love, the love of God is perfected in this. And by this, we know that we are in him. When you see you're growing, when you know that you're growing, when you have that experience with God, when you know that you've grown in God, when you can see the maturity in your own personal life, when you see that little bit of growth, when you see that, that blossom begin to open up, that bud begin to open up, and that bloom begin to open up, and you begin to see the maturity in your life a little bit, it don't mean that you got up and you preached your first sermon. It means that you are blossoming, that you are growing in the Word of God, that God has spoke to you, that God has revealed a passage of Scripture to you, that you've been able to witness to somebody, that God gave you an opportunity to care for somebody, that God opened a door, that He's maturing you in His Word, that He's showing you what it is to live the character life of his son Jesus Christ. He said by this we know. That we are in him. Amen. Oh how we need. To be maturing. In the word of God. 2022 is early. We're still in January. Oh how God would like to mature. Each and every one of us. We're not at our full maturity. There's not a one of us here, no matter what your age is, that is fully mature in the things of God. God wants to mature us. Let's look at verse 6. Because he's going to get deeper into some things here. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk. Boy, here's in horrible two words. Just as he walked. Those two words, just as, means to the same degree, same extent, as Jesus walked. Now that's putting on some pretty big shoes, ain't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But he said, he who says that he abides in him, Jesus, ought himself also to walk his daily pattern of life, ought also to walk his daily pattern of walk, life, ought to be just as he walked. But we've got this crutch today that we like to just stick it under our right arm or right shoulder and we like to hop along on the crutch and we say well we're still in the flesh and we can't do any better I'm going to sin and I've cussed all my life and I've told dirty jokes all my life and I, I've looked at pornography and I've done this and I've done that and it, it's just part of my life and I'm just an old sinful person down there on the face of this earth and there's just really nothing I, I, that I can do about it what did Jesus die for? He died for sins, didn't he? Is there any sin that you have in your life that Jesus cannot conquer if you will give it to him? No, there's not. You know the reason you continue to sin in it? Because you want to. There's nothing that Jesus cannot conquer in your life if you will give it to him. Amen. Nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing that Jesus cannot conquer in your life if you will give it to him. Amen. He died for all sins, not part of your sins, but all sins. But we've got that crutch. Well, I'm still in the flesh, and I'm going to sin, so we just give up. And Satan's sitting right there on our back, patting us on the shoulder and saying, you're right. You're still in the flesh. You're going to sin. Just give up on it. Let that sin get a little bigger. And don't worry about it. You're secure. And boy, is Satan having a heyday. When Jesus said, he who says, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, why don't we look like Christians? Why don't we talk like Christians? Why don't we act like Christians? Why don't we become resemblance? I know a lot of you didn't know, but there's a lot of Gerald Duncan and Sammy Duncan and Randy Duncan. There's a lot of resemblance in those two guys and their daddy. Why don't we resemble our daddy God, our daddy Jesus? Why don't when we see him, Keith walking down the street, or we see Wayne walking down the street, or Woody walking down the street, say, man, I see a resemblance of Jesus Christ right there. I see Jimmy Felder, I see a, a resemblance of Jesus Christ. Is that not what he's saying in that verse? That he who says that he abides in him all, himself also to walk, just as he walked. That when they see Gary Burden, that they ought to see and look at him and say, I see a resemblance of his father Jesus, of his father God. Is that not what he's saying in that verse? But we got that crutch under our arm. I'm still in the flesh. I still see him. I can't do any better. Yeah, we can. Do we want to do better? We say with our lips that we want to do better. But when we want to do better, do we ever put any plans of action together to change anything? Or do we practice the law of insanity? I'm going to do the same thing the same way every day and expect different results. I'm going to get up and live my life the same way tomorrow. I'm going to read the Bible the same way I did yesterday. I'm going to pray the same way I did yesterday. But I expect to be more like Jesus. It's not going to happen. Until we formulate a plan with God's help and says, I want to change some things that will make me more mature and more like Jesus then we're not going to change. 
we will be the same person next Sunday that we are this Sunday unless we decide that we're going to change some things and make ourselves more the image of Jesus Christ. There's no need you coming to me after church and saying, what do I need to change? You and God know what you need to change. Me and God know what I need to change. And I want to tell you, if we want to see our church change, we'll get right with God and talk to him about it. Amen. But I think, I think it was Miss Rita that said Wednesday night how complacent the world was and how people are just okay with the way everything is. I mean, it don't matter. We're just, we're okay with everything in the world, the way the world is today. We've got everything took care of. If, if, I mean, the gover government's going to take care of us. I mean, if, if the world shuts down again, we'll get some more checks in the mail and everything's going to be took care of. We really don't need to be more like God and we don't need more of God anymore. We got it all took care of. We made it through the last two years. Been some pretty critical times, but government's bailed us out. We know better than that. That's why God is the tsunami that's just happening right now. All of the 200-mile tornado. Where do you think all these things come from? It's God controlled, is it not? All these wildfires that just burn house after house after house, acre after acre after acre, earthquakes, everything. God is crying. People look up to me. We've got our head like an ostrich stuck in the sand and saying, I ain't listening. I ain't listening. One day we're going to listen. I don't know whether he's going to come back before we see a horrible punishment to the United States of America or not because I think God's very very angry with the United States of America right now yeah. and I don't know whether he's going to stop it by coming and getting his children before he really gets rough with the United States of America or not but I want to get closer and closer and closer to him every day Amen. so that when that time comes I'm ready to ship out and I'm ready to ship out I'm ready for him to come back because I believe there's less and less Christians today. It seems like it's so hard to get people to listen to the gospel today. It seems like they just, I mean, you can't even keep them on the subject. They just get, well, I won't even use the word. I mean, they just, you can't even talk to them about it anymore. I'm going to stop right there. I've, I've got, I want to go into the next part of that. But that's about loving our neighbor. And I, that's a different section. That's, I, I really want to wait till next week to do that. Randy, if you would get us on of invitation. I don't know how God spoke to us this morning. Uh, I just pray that we'll search our lives. And if your life's okay, you know as well as I know, we've probably got close to 350 people on our church roll right now. And I'll bet you we hadn't got 50 of those people coming to our church.